Dave Michelin. Um, thank you so much, Liz, for that introduction. And thank you all for being here for the work that you're all doing. I'm really impressed there's this many, um, you know, leaders in, in who are really young. And, you know, that's so important for movement. So, um, uh, so today I'm talking about what the atheist movement can learn from the gay, lesbian, bi, trans movement. Um, the atheist movement is already modeling ourselves in many ways on the LGBT movement, and we should. Uh, the parallels between the two movements are sometimes eerie. If I had more time, I would go into it in great detail, but I think a lot of us are familiar with them. And since the LGBT movement is roughly, in my evaluation, about 35 years ahead of the atheist movement, um, I tend to think that we're about where the LGBT movement was uh, in the early 70s, right after the Stonewall riots. Um, we have a unique chance to learn from that movement, both from its successes and its failures. Um, very quick tangent here. Uh, who here is familiar with the Stonewall Riots? Okay, there's, a, there's enough people who aren't going to very quickly summarize them. Uh, the Stonewall Riots happened in 1969, and they're generally considered to be the beginning of the modern LGBT movement. Uh, there had been a gay movement before that for decades, uh, but in 1969, uh, there was the police uh, uh, in New York City tried to basically raided a gay bar in Stonewall Inn, and which they've done dozens of times. And on this particular night, uh, the gays fought back, and there was rioting in the streets for several days. And that's generally considered to have sparked, even though there was a foundation for the movement before that, that sparked the modern, very visible, very vocal, very activist and organized uh, gay movement. It's similarly. Obviously, the atheist movement has existed for decades, centuries, before the so-called new atheist movement. But it's also undeniable that there's, there is this, we've become newly energized and vocal and visible in just the last few years. So that's why I say we're about 35 years behind the LGBT movement. And therefore, we have a lot to learn. Um, since I only have 20 minutes, I'm going to dispense with any further preliminaries and history lessons and jump right to the chase. Um, I think the single most important number one thing that atheists can learn from the LGBT movement is to encourage visibility and coming out, and to work harder on making the atheist movement a safer place to come out into. Uh, very early in the LGBT movement, it became clear that coming out is the single most powerful political act that a gay person can do. Um, consistently, polls show that the single factor most likely to make people support gay rights is whether they know personally a gay person, or more accurately, whether they know that they know a gay person, because they probably do, even if they don't know it. Um, and this is a lesson that the atheist movement has been taking to heart with the out campaign, the atheist bus ads, and billboards, etc. Um, we're doing an excellent job with visibility. Uh, and we've gone from being on pretty much nobody's radar to being a major topic of water coolers and pundits and op ed columns in a really remarkable short space of time. We need to give ourselves credit for that. We went from zero to 60 very fast. Um, but I think we're doing a less consistent job of making the atheist movement a safe place to land once people do come out. And I think we can learn a lot from the LGBT movement about how to do that. Uh, in the post-Stonewall days of uh, the gay movement, there was this massive blossoming of uh, LGBT community centers, bookstores, coffee houses, political groups, bars, bowling leagues, knitting circles. Um, coming out as queer often meant leaving behind your friends and family, alienating them at best, and in some cases, really disadvantaging them and cutting them out of their life. And so queers formed our own social support network to take the place of the ones that rejected us. And the atheist movement has not been as strong about this. Now, online we have. We've done an excellent job of providing online communities for atheists of a wide stripe from angry, mocking, ferungulites to the friendly, <laughs> gentle, friendly atheist followers. Um, but we haven't done as good a job at providing in the flesh support networks to replace the churches, synagogues, mosques, covens, etc., and the sense of belonging and common purpose that they provide. And I'll include myself in that as part of the problem. Um, I am much better at uh, participating in the online atheist movement than I am at actually showing up to the local meetings. It's like, it takes me two minutes to turn on my computer, it takes me an hour to get to places on the bus, so I do what's easier. Um, and I think one of the things that we can learn from the LGBT movement is to remember how difficult coming out is. Uh, we need to remember that when we encourage people to rethink religion and consider atheism, 
we really are asking a lot. We're not just asking people to reshape the entire philosophical foundation of their lives and let go of the major source of comfort that they've relied on for years. We're also, in addition to that, asking them in many cases to alienate their friends, their family, and the community that they've known for their whole life. Um, and I would love to see us do a better job of providing something to replace that work. Now, I will say, since this is a conference for the Secular Student Alliance, that the college and university groups have, to a great extent, been an exception to this rule. Um, the student groups have been providing a great deal of in-the-flesh support and community for fledgling atheists as well as for long-term atheists. Um, what I would love to do is I would love to encourage uh, the leaders of those groups to continue that community work after you leave school. Um, I'd like to encourage you to carry that work out into the non-college and university world. Um, also, from what I've been hearing Liz talk about this earlier, um, even student groups have continuity problems. They tend to fold if the driving force behind them is the unmitigated gall to graduate. Um, <laughs> Um, and so, as Liz talked about, um, I would love to encourage student groups to just be aware of that phenomenon and to make plans for smooth transition, et cetera. Um, so there's another lesson that I think atheists can learn from the LGBT movement. Um, and this is one that it took uh, the gay movement a little while to learn. And that's to let firebrands be firebrands and to let diplomats be diplomats. Um, we need to recognize that not all activists pursue activism in the same way. We need to recognize that using both more confrontational and more diplomatic approaches makes us a stronger movement. And that both of these approaches used together synergistically are much more powerful than either one used alone. Um, to some extent, the LGBT movement is still learning this lesson. We still have our squabbles about this, but we've become much better about it. Uh, we've become better about consciously using that tension and this sort of two-pronged approach and really strategizing around it. Uh, and our movement has become a lot stronger as a result. Uh, here's an example. In the queer activist movement of the 80s and 90s, uh, loud, angry street activists, groups like Act Up and Queer Nation, or sort of the moral equivalent of Perigula, um, often accused the more mild-mannered lobbying groups of assimilationism, excessive compromise, selling out, and the wild matter groups often accuse the street activists of being overly idealistic, alienating potential allies, making everybody's job harder. I'm sure one of this is outside of the theory of everybody, right? Um, but when we look at those years in retrospect in the gay movement, it becomes clear that both methods together were far more effective than either method would have been alone. Part of this is simply that different methods of activism speak to different people. Some folks are better able to hear a quiet, sympathetic voice. Others are better able to hear a passionate cry for justice or even a really snarky joke. Um, and do not underestimate the good cop, bad cop dynamic. Um, that can be very effective. Again, in the queer movement of the 80s and 90s, the street activists got attention, got on the news. They raised general visibility and awareness of our issues. And then the polite negotiators could raise a more polite, nuanced form of hell, um, knowing that the people they were working with had a baseline familiarity with the issues because they'd seen the act up on the news. Um, and when the street activists presented more hardline demands, that made the polite negotiators seem more reasonable by comparison. And the line between an extremist position and a moderate one kept getting moved in our direction. Um, we see this working today uh, most vividly, I think, with the same-sex marriage debate. Obviously, it's been a very difficult debate. We've had some successes. We've had some very disappointing, frustrating failures. But one of the things that the same-sex marriage debate has done is it's made civil unions seem like the moderate position. Even the conservative position, I mean, conservatives are coming out and saying, well, yes, yeah, civil unions are okay. I just don't agree with same-sex marriage. They were not saying that 10 years ago. You know, by advocating for same-sex marriage, I think we're eventually going to get same-sex marriage in this whole country, but we also move the line of what's considered moderate position. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't debate our tactical differences on any given issue. It's sometimes worth debating whether diplomacy or confrontation or a combination will be a more effective tactic in that particular case. But I'd really like us to stop treating these debates as if they were larger questions of morality and character that have to be resolved once and for all in one direction or the other. We don't have to decide confrontation is always better or diplomacy is always better. Um, we all do what we're inspired to do and we do what we're good at. 
Some of us are good at passionate confrontational idealism. <laughs> <laughs> and some of us are good at sympathy with our opponents. And I'm actually one of those two. Some of us are good at a mix of those approaches. Um, so I think the diplomatic atheists need to stop trying to shut up the firebrands. Stop accusing them of the enemy. And I'll be fair, the firebrand atheists need to stop accusing the diplomats of being wusses. It's a waste of everybody's time and energy. Um, and speaking of wasting everybody's time and energy, uh, there's a third very important lesson that the godless movement can learn from the LGBT movement, and that's to not waste our time squabbling about language. We need to let godless people use whatever language they want to define themselves. Um, again, there's a very parallel here between the non-theist movement and the LGBT movement. It's a similarity between two relationships, the relationship between homosexuals and bisexuals on one hand, and the relationships between atheists and agnostics on the other. I identify as a bisexual. And in the past, I've had to put up with a fair amount of crap from gays and lesbians <laughs> telling me that I'm, quote, really lesbian. And just <laughs> um, it's so not helpful. Um, the question of how to name your sexual identity is very personal. And different factors have different weight for different people. Um, I'm about a Kinsey 5, that's the Kinsey sexual orientation scale of 0 to 6, 0 being entirely heterosexual, 6 being entirely homosexual. Um, I'm about a Kinsey 5, I'm mainly oriented towards women, I have some interest in men, but I call myself bisexual because to me that interest in men isn't trivial. It's included important relationships in my life, it's an important part of how I view the world sexually, um, but for some other Kinsey 5, that some interest in the opposite sex it just might not be that important to them. So they might choose to call themselves gay or lesbian. And that's totally their right, just like it's my right to call myself bisexual. These terms don't have clear definitions everyone agrees on. It's not like there's a perfect bisexual in a vacuum in the Smithsonian. So within reason, we have the right to use this language in a way that makes sense for us. Uh, you all see where I'm going with this? <laughs> Let's look at the Richard Dawkins belief scale. <laughs> one to seven. One being absolute certainty that there is a God, seven being absolute certainty there isn't. Quick tangent, I so wish he'd made it from zero to six so it would line up with the Kinsey scale. <laughs> 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 anyway. Um, so I'm about a six on the Dawkins scale, maybe six and a half, and I call myself an atheist. Because that glimmer of uncertainty, it's not very important to me. It's hypothetically possible that I might be wrong. It's hypothetically possible that I might be wrong about unicorns not existing, too. It's not going to keep me up at night. Uh, but someone else who's a six on the Dawkins scale, that glimmer of uncertainty might be really important to them. Even if they have exactly the same amount of doubt that I do, the fact of that doubt might really matter to them. So even though we're in the same place on the Dawkins scale, it's totally reasonable for them to call themselves agnostic, while I call myself an atheist. Again, there's no perfect atheist in a vacuum in the Smithsonian. Um, this language is imprecise. It's still evolving, and the power to name ourselves is too important to try to take it away from each other. So, in the same way that gays and lesbians have, for the most part, uh, learned to quit telling bisexuals that they're really gay or lesbian and are just afraid to admit it, um, I think atheists need to quit telling agnostics that they're really atheists and are just afraid to admit it. Um, by the same token, just like bisexuals have to quit saying everyone's basically bisexual, um, I used to say that, I'm so embarrassed, I'm sorry. I officially apologize, everyone is not basically bisexual. Um, agnostics have to shut up about how most, most atheists are really agnostic, how true atheism is a belief system just as much as religion and etc. Um, Atheists and agnostics are natural allies, <coughs> along with humanists, skeptics, materialists, naturalists, brights, free thinkers, etc. Much like gays and lesbians and bisexuals and transgender people and intersex people are natural allies. And we shouldn't waste our time and energy squabbling because you say tomato and I say tomorrow. Uh, and I want to close with one more lesson that the atheist movement can learn from the LGBT movement. There's more, but I'm running out of time, so this is going to be my last one for today. Um, and this is a lesson that atheists can learn, not just from the successes of the LGBT movement, but from one of our biggest failures. And it's a failure that has come back to bite us on the ass time and time again. 
Atheists need to work now on making our movement more diverse and making it more welcoming and inclusive of women and people of color. And by now, I mean now. We need to start on this now so we don't get set into patterns and vicious circles and self-fulfilling prophecies that in 10 or 20 years from now are going to be damn near impossible to fix. Uh, so what can we learn from the LGBT movement? The LGBT movement screwed this up, and it screwed it up badly. Uh, the early LGBT movement was very much dominated by gay white men. The public representatives of that movement were mostly gay white men. Most organizations were led by gay white men. And the gay white male leaders had some seriously bad race and gender stuff going on. And we're paying for that today. Relations between lesbians and gay men, between white queers and queers of color, are often strained at best. Conversations in our movement about race and gender take place in a decades old minefield of rancor and bitterness where almost no, nothing anybody says is right. Um, and we still, after decades, have a strong tendency to put gay <laughs> white men front and center as the most visible, iconic representatives of our community. Uh, that makes it hard on everyone in the LGBT movement, women and men of all races. Uh, it creates rifts that makes our community weaker. We spend time fighting about these issues that would be better spent fighting our opponents. Uh, and it has a seriously bad impact on our ability to make effective social change. For instance, the LGBT movement has a profoundly impaired impact uh, ability to shift homophobic attitudes in the black communities, since those communities can claim entirely fairly that the gay community doesn't care about black people and hasn't made an effort to deal with our racism. We screwed this up. We still screw this up. We are paying for our screw-ups. Atheists have a chance to not do this. We're still fairly early in the very visible, very vocal, very activist, and very organized stage of our movement, and we have a chance to get this right, or to get it less wrong. Um, the atheist movement is currently dominated by white men, especially in positions of visibility and leadership, and many atheists resist seeing this as a problem that we need to take action on. They're not overtly racist or sexist, they're not saying, no, we don't want women and people of color in our movement, but they don't see this as their responsibility and they don't see it as particularly important. Um, I could give an entire talk on why this is important. Um, I could give an entire talk on how racism and sexism aren't always conscious, and how we perpetuate them without even thinking about them, and why we therefore need to pay conscious attention to countering them. I could give an entire talk on how people tend to focus on the things <coughs> that personally affect them naturally. Uh, so an atheist movement dominated by white men will naturally and not consciously, tend to focus on issues that largely affect white men, at the expense of issues that largely concern women and people of color. Um, I could talk about self-fulfilling prophecies, how even if the predominant whiteness and maleness of the atheist movement were purely accidental, purely coincidental, this pattern would still get perpetuated and ingrained and deeper over the years, because women and people of color feel less welcome in a movement that's largely white and male, and the less welcome they slash we feel, the longer the movement goes on to be largely white and male. But I'm running out of time, so <coughs> I really want to say this. Look at every other movement for social change in recent history. Every single one that I know of has been bitten on the ass by this issue. Every single one now wishes they'd taken action on it in the early days, before bad habits and self-fulfilling prophecies got set into a deep groove that's hard to break out of. And that includes the LGBT movement as well as the labor movement and, and any progressive feminist movement, any progressive movement I can think of. Um, there's lots of good reasons for atheists to work on this. There's idealistic reasons because religion hurts women and people of color as much as it hurts white men. I mean, because female atheists and atheists of color matter as much as white male atheists. Um, and there's very practical Machiavellian reasons for doing this. It'll make our movement stronger, larger, better at reaching more people. Um, but if you're still wondering why this is important, talk to anyone who's seriously involved in the LGBT movement today and ask them, if you could go back to 1970 and get the early leaders of the post-Stonewall movement to deal with race and sex, would you do it? And I can guarantee you that just about every one of them would fervently respond, yes, to the sweet love of Loki and all the gods of our house. <laughs> if we could go back in time and not screw that up, we would do it. Uh, 
So we have a chance in the atheist movement to not screw this up. Uh, we have a chance to start dealing with this now, so it's less of a problem in 10 or 20 years. And so we're not wasting our time and energy 10 or 20 years from now trying to fix what we could be fixing now. Um, let's learn from the mistakes of the LGBT movement as well as from its successes, and let's take advantage of that chance. strongly that straight men have her back. 
Um, so, um, but yes, I would like to see more outreach to um, uh, the gay movement, if only because, for reasons of their own, the gay movement is not all that atheist positive. Um, and you know, they're sort of trying to do the progressive, welcoming, inclusive religion thing. Um, uh, and uh, you know, and, and as a result of that, a lot of atheists feel excluded. So I think that it's not so much that um, uh, the atheist movement has, hasn't been, uh, you know, they're, they're great on gay issues, but uh, uh, yes, I would love to see a little more outreach just because a lot of uh, gay atheists don't feel comfortable in the gay community. They don't feel comfortable in the atheist community. I will take one more question. Uh, I have more time. Um, do, do one more we can stay on our budget and I All right, uh, I'll take two more. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yeah, a little question, but you said that uh, two groups should do an outreach more to mm -hmm. the minority individuals. Mm -hmm. Do you think also it's kind of like a demographic issue in a way that uh, somehow by default white men tend to be more atheist? Because, for example, I know a lot of the groups on campus, mm -hmm. religious groups, that are ethnic religious groups, like mm -hmm. black, mm -hmm. Baptist, or Korean Methodists, or Korean um, so the question was, is it just, does it just happen that atheists are more naturally democratic, demographically white? Um, uh, there was a poll that was done recently uh, that was breaking down you know, religious beliefs by, by race, and what they found was that that's not true. Uh, that uh, African Americans and Hispanics and Asians are pretty much as likely to be atheists as white, they're just not as likely to be as public about it. And there's reasons for that, there's cultural reasons having to do with you know, the way that the, for instance, the African American uh, community and the Hispanic community is very organized <coughs> around the churches. Uh, but I think that we need to not just say, oh, well, they have their special needs and therefore we're going to keep catering to the needs of white people. Uh, we need to say, well, gee, they have, this, they have this special thing, so how can we deal with that? What, what can we offer them to make our movement more welcoming? You know, we've, um, uh, so I, I think it's a mistake to just say, oh well, they're just not interested in atheism anyway, so we don't have to worry about it. That's part of how the self-perpetuating circle happens. Uh, do you have a question? I was just gonna ask if you just sort of thought about the poll that I have, what your perception of the biggest variance of atheist community is not supporting the needs of, uh, or interests of women as much? Um, uh, well, let's see. Um, there's a, so the question is, uh, how is the atheist movement not uh, catering to the needs of women? Um, some of it is that when people in the atheist movement say and do really sexist things, um, and when women call them on it, it sort of turns into this firestorm of you're just being politically correct, you know, how dare you, um, you know, you're trying to censor us by, you know, critiquing crit 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 us. And it's funny because, you know, if something <coughs> else, if some religious person says you're trying to censor us by critiquing us, we get our panties in a twist. But when somebody says to us, you know, hey, you're doing something that's that's not that's not so cool. We say, oh, you're trying to censor us. So I think that that's that's a lot of it. Um, uh, is to just to be, you know, when people critique you, listen. You know, you don't necessarily have to agree with them, but listen for five minutes before your very first reflective reaction is to say that's not fair and you're being PC. Um, I would also say that this has to do with both women and people of color. Um, I think we need to be aware of economic issues. It's like at conferences and stuff like that. Um, you know, it's conferences are expensive and travel to conferences are expensive. I'd like to see more scholarships for uh, people who can't necessarily afford, and also childcare. <laughs> um, so I could go on about that, but we're running out of time. So thank you so much.